chapter 78, Psalm 78, I will read the first 25 verses, it's a long chapter, I wish we had the time, we would have considered the whole of it, but uh, let's do the first 25 verses. I'm reading from ESV. A maskil of Asaph. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark things from of old, things that we have heard and known, that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to their coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. The Ephraimites, armed with a bow, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. They forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. In the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through it, and made the waters stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart, by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rock so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also give bread or provide meat for his people? Therefore, when the Lord heard, he was full of wrath. A fire was kindled against Jacob. His anger rose against Israel because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his saving power. Yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven, and he rained down on them manna to eat, and gave them the grain of heaven. Man ate of the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful that you have gathered us this morning to hear from you. And even as we consider how we can take care of this and the next generation to glorify and to honor you, we pray the Lord may you impart in our lives to understand your word, and even more importantly, to put it into practice in our daily lives. For this is our prayer in Christ, Lord, our Savior. Amen. One of the biggest conversations happening today in the world is on the issue of sustainability. Long word. But sustainability means this, that how can the world today meet their needs without compromising the needs of the people that will come in future, the generation that will come? Sustainability. How do we use the scarce resources that we have today to make sure that we not only fulfill our needs today, but also take care of the needs of the people that will come after us? And as the world is having this conversation, they are considering three pillars, environmental, social, and economic. Environmental aspect, they want to look at how the environmental systems of the world can be able to balance the natural resources so that we can be able to enjoy the natural resources today and these same resources can be enjoyed by the people that will come after us. And that's why we have the conversation on why we need to plant trees, the issue of global warming. All these points to that aspect of sustainability. The social aspect speaks of the universal human rights. And that's why we have bodies like the ICC. Because the intention is to ensure that the whole world has some form of universal human rights. Uh, the health care that you enjoy, the NHIF is part of the product of this goal of sustainability, that we can be able to take care of our health today, but at the same time, take care of the health needs of your children in future, so that this becomes sustainable. And of course, the economic aspect 
is how each nation of the world can be able to maintain independence and access resources that will promote secure sources of livelihood. How can an economy have enough resources to meet their needs today and the needs to come for the generation to come? But sadly, I feel like that one of the aspects that is missing in this aspect of sustainability is how do we also ensure spiritual sustainability. We speak about economic, environmental, and social, but rarely do we consider how then can we take care of the needs of Christians today and Christians that will come in the days to come. And I feel that Christians today ought to take the blame for part of the menace that is happening in our nation today and in our world. The immorality that cuts across all cultures today is partly to be blamed on Christians. And this is because we have neglected the need to achieve spiritual sustainability. How do we pass on the gospel that we received from our forefathers to the next generation? We have become a generation of ignorant and selfish believers that are more interested in promoting our environmental aspects we are interested in promoting our social aspects. We are interested in promoting our economic needs. We think about how do I make my business more profitable today and ensure that even my children who will come and their children will enjoy the benefits of my business. But rarely do we ask ourselves, I'm such a sound Christian today. How do I make sure that the soundness that I have as a believer is passed on to the next generation and the next generation so that the generation that follows after me also bears the same characteristics of staunch believers. And today we have so many folks, so many parents who are struggling to convince their children to come to church. And yet they miss the opportunity when the children were barely young. They miss the opportunity to train their children to come to the house of the Lord. The aspect of democracy has polluted our minds as believers so that we have left the choice to come to church, the choice to become a member of a community of believers, for them to decide. I remember how we, when we were young, the debate on whether to go to church was never to be tabled in the house. All of us, as many as we are here, know of how much our parents in the past struggled to make sure that all of us come to church. And for many of us who are here today, we are beneficiaries of how strict our parents were at that time to make sure that we all come to church. Whether we were going to come to church to listen, whether we were going to come to church and speak to people, they didn't care. Theirs was to fulfill the responsibility that God had put in their hands, making sure that the gospel that God had given to them is passed on to their children. But then, the aspect of democracy has spoiled our minds, and we are constantly working towards achieving sustainability of all the aspects of our lives. But the one crucial thing that determines whether we will ever see our children again once we die here, we take it for granted. Did you know that if you have not passed on the gospel to your children, that if you died today, they have no hope of seeing you ever again because your destinies will be different? Do you know that you bear the responsibility of passing on this gospel to the next generation? And you feel, if you think that these are my words, then the text we have just read today commands us to pass the gospel that we have received to the next generation. The responsibility of passing the gospel to your children and their children, your granddaughters and grandsons, is not a responsibility of the pastor. The pastor is responsible for teaching you the word so that you can go home and do the same with your children and your grandchildren. For those of, who, of you whose children are born again, praise the Lord. But that, that does not mean that you are off the hook. You have grandchildren, you have nieces, you have nephews who do not know Christ. And the word of God this day reminds us that all of us here have a responsibility to pass on this gospel that we received to the next generation. So Psalm 78 is a psalm that ought to be in your minds every time you sit with your families. Because this is not just a psalm written from nowhere. It is a psalm that commands you and I to now take responsibilities of, your, of our families 
in terms of making sure that we pass on the gospel to their generation. If there is one legacy that you must prioritize in your life, it is the legacy of having a family that believes in God. It is the legacy of making sure that your children, your grandchildren, understand why the gospel matters. How can we take care of our spiritual needs today and at the same time take care of the needs of the generation to come in terms of the spiritual aspect? And that's the question that we'll seek to answer today even as Asaph writes in Psalm 78. Now I'm sure for many of you, you have read Psalms written by Asaph. This is one of the Psalms written by Asaph. And he has written 12 Psalms. Uh, Psalms chapter 50 and Psalms chapter 73 all the way to chapter 80, 83. Now, Asaph, for those who are wondering, Asaph was a worship leader in the tabernacle. His roles, he was actually appointed to this position by David in First Chronicles chapter 6, verse 31 to verse 39. And his duty, his primary duty as a worship leader was to write songs, to write poems, and to instruct people on how they are supposed to live their lives in pursuit of God. It was his responsibility to make sure that people understand who God is through songs and poems. And what we have just read is one of the songs or poems. We may never know whether it was a song or poem, but this is one of his writings addressing the church of the day, the tabernacle, the people of Israel, instructing them on what God demands. And when you read Psalm 78, it points to us some harsh realities that happen when a generation fails to pass on the baton of the gospel to the next generation. I firmly believe that part of the reason why we have so many problems in our society today is because in one way or the other, believers do not consider the power of the gospel of any significance than any other power. We would rather spend our resources taking our children to the best of schools, to invest in the best of businesses, to make sure that they have the best of the land. But yet all this is done at the expense of them missing eternity. If you didn't get an opportunity during the Bold Evangelism Month to preach the gospel to your children and your grandchildren, then we missed the point. Because the goal of this life is to make sure that any good thing that happens to you is shared to your generation, first to your generation. Even Paul writes that Christ came first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. It has got to begin with your own. So if your own do not have the opportunity to hear the gospel from you, then why should other people get the opportunity to hear the gospel from you? If you cannot take the initiative to share the gospel with your very own children, then what business do we have to share the gospel with other people of the world? This psalm that we read today reminds us of what must happen in our lives if we want to take care of this generation. And this generation means the children that we already have. This generation means the brothers and sisters that we already have. The opportunities that we take to share the gospel with people that we already have in our context but also take care of the needs of the next generation. How do we, what's our plan? What's our big plan in making sure that although I'm a Christian today, this culture of Christianity in my life will be maintained throughout my family line. We read of so many stories of people who served God in positions including pastors, but yet their children ended up being completely lost. The other day I was watching, I was reading online, about the story of this man called Munish. All of you, for those who remember his songs, he was one of the best writers of, our, of his time in our country. But Munish disappeared into the public space because of the struggles he had to go through because of his child. His son became the, the, the criminal leader in Gong. And for many days, he had to go to the police station to bail him out. And people would look at him and ask him, we thought that you were a pastor. We thought that you were a great gospel minister. Then what, what did you get wrong with your child? And that way, Munish disappeared into the public space. His son has been in prison multiple times. He has been accused of serious criminal offenses. 
And you and I know that there are people who are intercessors in our days. There are people who are pastors in our days. There are people who are elders in our days. There are people who are committed believers. But yet again, when you look at the lifeline of their children, it, it feels like these are people different, living in very different worlds. And when we check ourselves, we are not very far from getting there. Unless we understand what Asaf is writing to us today, we are on the verge of losing it, just like the generations that have, we have seen lo lost it. So what is Asaf telling us in terms of how we can be able to take care of this generation and the next generation? And this is our responsibility as Asaf is writing to us. The first thing that Asaf is pointing to us is that we have a responsibility to teach the word. Teach the word. Verse 2 to verse 6 says this, I will open my mouth in a parable. And he quotes this from Psalms chapter 9 verse 4. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them. Teach the word. And we're not talking about pastors taking the responsibility of teaching the word. We are talking about the responsibility of you who already has a generation to teach the word. Now, notice what Asaf is saying here. He's not talking about sharing information that you so much love or information that you would have desired to share. He's not saying that I want you to share something strange. He's not saying that I want you to be uh, creative in finding a way of communicating philosophies that will help your next generation. Asaf is giving them basic principles. He's saying, I want you not to hide from your children, but tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord. And these are not glorious deeds of the Lord that they are not familiar with. In fact, for the next 72 verses, he will give them clear examples in history where they saw the glorious deeds of the Lord. He reminds them of when they were in the wilderness and God pushed, uh, was fighting for them throughout their walk in the wilderness. He reminds them of that instance when they needed food and God provided manna from heaven. He reminds them of when they needed water and Moses had to tap on the rock and they had water. He is not telling them to tell them anything different from what they already know. When God commands us to teach our children and their children the word of God, he's not telling us to come with a strange gospel. He's not telling us to come with our own ideas. He's basically telling us, go back to scripture, read it, and share it to the next generation. And that's your responsibility. That the next generation depends on this generation to understand who God is. You know, it's not enough for families to come together and just pray for food and go to sleep. It is not enough for families to walk together to church. It is not enough for families to enjoy their time in a worship event. And yet, they don't take the initiative from a family setup to discuss the word of God. And unless you lead the way, your family will never, will never understand the significance of this word that you proclaim. Unless you train this generation and the next generation on the benefits of understanding the word of God, they will never hold the word of God in high significance. The opportunity to teach your children and your grandchildren is not an opportunity for you to share your ideas. It is not an opportunity for you, for, for you to affirm to them that you made very good choices in life in terms of your economy, in terms of your environment, in terms of your social life, it is an opportunity for us to pass on the gospel that we have already received to them through the word of God. 
And for all of us here, we have somebody in our family who does not know God. And for all of us here, we have people that we constantly cry out to God for God to save their lives. If it is not your child, it is your grandchild. If it is not your grandchild, it's your cousin, it's your nephew, it is your daughter-in-law or your sister-in-law. Somebody lost. And if it is not important to you that you get to see them in heaven as you celebrate your victory here on earth, then there is a problem. It's a big problem when people of this day and age do not consider with high regard the need to pass on the gospel to the next generation. We want to invest in everything else but the gospel. When was the last time you had an, a moment with your family together and asked them to sit down so that you can share the word of God with them? When was the last time you called your family together and told them, today I want us to have a study, to study about God? Or do we find more time to talk about whether Kenya Kwanza or Azimio or Wajakoya and the rest of the political affiliations will do for us? Or do we take more time to think about whether the presidency will serve as it promised? Or do we take time to think about their grades in school? For some of these children today, the only time they get the opportunity to sit with their parents is when they are being asked, what do you need to go to school? What, what are your grades? You need to improve on this area. And when it comes to sharing the word of God, this seems to be none of the people's business in that family. I want to challenge all of us that as soon as today, that all of us in our family set up, we can be able to come together and teach our generation and the next generation the word of God. If we lose it now, ask any person who has a mature person in their house and they'll tell you, it was much easier to share the gospel when they were young than it is when they are of age now. Because at this point, they have already made their choices. They already know what's good for them, what's bad for them. And for some of them, they have already developed a culture where they understand that the gospel is not of any significance to them. And so the earlier you begin this, the better. And for those who are still young, those who, are do who don't have families, I think you should be more worried. You should be more worried because in this day and age, when you are living at a time where people don't hold the word of God to high significance, can you imagine what will happen in the next 30 years? What will stop the continent of Africa from suffering the same fate as Europe, where churches are closing down? Because people don't consider church of any significance. People do not consider the word of God of any significance. And churches are closing down and being transformed to pubs and clubs. What will stop Africa from going that direction unless the young people of today understand the importance of teaching the word of God to this generation and the next generation. Friends, teach the word of God to your children. Let them know that it's the word of God that keeps you going. Let them know that if they ever need to run to a place for help, it has got to be the word of God. And so Asaf reminds us that one of the things that we need to do as we seek to achieve spiritual sustainability, as we seek to achieve a, 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 a spiritual congregation of the future, a community that will be faithful servers of God, we have got to teach our children and our grandchildren the word of God. The second thing that he mentions from verse 6 to verse 20, in fact, he mentions this from verse 6 to verse 72, is that you and I, of this generation, we have got to testify about God. Testify about God to this generation. Scientists argue that we live in a generation where um, people want to find examples of things they can be able to relate to. People want to read stories of things they can be able to relate to. And that's why we have uh, industries that have cropped up and have thrived because of this. The industry of motivational speaking, the industry of weight loss, and the social media. They thrive in the fact that people today, the generation today, thrives in looking at stories and finding how they can be able to relate and fit in 
in that story. And believers are not any different. This generation and the next generation will want to know, why are you asking me to accept the Lord as my Savior? What is it that has happened in your life that warrants you to share this message to me? And as Asaf is writing, all the way from verse 6 to verse 72, he is accounting and testifying of what the Lord had done for the people of Israel throughout the age. He mentions clear examples and testimonies of what God did for the people. How God walked with them throughout the wilderness. Something they would never have done on their own. He reminds them of how God provided for them food. And even quotes that for the first time man got the opportunity to eat the very food that the angels eat. Manna. What a way God provided for the people of Israel. And these were stories worth sharing to the next generation. And he, in fact, he charges them that I want you to share this gospel and share these testimonies to these people so that the generation that will come will always know that there was once a God that provided to our generation. And unless we live for this God, he will do the same in our generation. Unfortunately, we live in a world today where people want to take credit even for things they did not do. People want to take credit because of the progress that we see. I remember how my mom made us pray for things that she already had. And this was part of her training us to know that for everything that we get in our home, it is not her who provided, it is God. And so I remember one time, we wanted to really have those pens that we put ink. And uh, 25 shillings was a lot of money. And so she would tell you on Saturday, you, you go and report to her on Friday that, Mom, I don't have a pen. She knows that she bought in bulk and she put them somewhere. And then she tells you, I want you to pray that God will provide. I don't know how, but go ahead and pray and trust that God will provide. And so on Saturday and Sunday, the, when you go to church, the prayer item in your heart is that God, Aki, please, please, I don't have a pen, but do whatever you can to provide that pen. And my mom knows that she has it in her purse. And then on Monday morning, she gives you. Who do you credit that blessing? You credit God. Because you know, that pen, I had to pray for it. God made sure that my mom gets the money to provide the pen. And so it's not my mom who provided. It's God who provided. Because she wants you to learn as young as you are, to testify of the good things that the Lord has done for you. But today, the generation today wants to take credit for everything that they get in their lives. If you paid school fees on time, you claim, ah, boss, ni kujituma mapema mapema, unatafta pesa, unalipa shule mapema. If you pass your exams, you want to claim that, hey, boss, God alini bless na kichwa, na akili. I am smart. I am able to do these things. Bring them on. If you built a good, nice house, you want to claim, boss, kama una pesa, wengine wetu tukona nini? And God has blessed us with good minds to design good houses. For people who have scaled the heights of their careers, they claim that it's because of their hard work that they have all the blessings that they have. And in one way or the other, we constantly rob God of the glory he was supposed to receive. And in that place, we receive the glory. And so every time we see you around in a nice car, eh, sama ujama, bidi, bidi. Bidi, ona venye bidi nafanya mutu. And the truth is, it's, it has been gold all the way. Do you know that there are people who will never accept God as their savior because you failed to testify of what God did to you? There are people who depend on you coming out and truly and honestly share the testimony of what God has done for you. And all they need to do is believe by seeing what God has done to you. And Asaf is concerned of what information are you passing on to the next generation. If you cannot take the opportunity to testify about what God has done for you, let me instruct you. And he begins by writing exactly what all of them could relate to. Sometimes, 
you don't even need to have a miracle in your very own life. You need to speak about the miracles that have happened in other people's life and people will trust God. Sometimes we ask ourselves, what has God done for me so that I can testify? And I think it's at that moment that we realize that we're actually robbing God of the glory that he deserves. We have robbed God his glory in so many ways. And unless we learn to tell this generation that the things that you see us achieve is never because of our hard work, but it's because God provided to us, we'll continue to lose more people to suicide and murder and homicides. Because I firmly believe that part of the reason why we have so many young people who are committing suicide today is because when we ask them why they are not successful, we claim that these people don't work hard enough. We challenge them, why are you not working hard enough? And now she has a good job. Why are you not working hard enough? But the truth is, they probably work twice as hard as we did. And yet, opportunities never open up. And because they have learned to credit blessings to hard work and not to God, we continue to lose them to depression. We continue to lose them to suicide. May the Lord forgive us. For moments when we took the glory instead of testifying about his goodness so that the next generation gets to know that it has never been us. It has always been about God. The next time your daughter asks you, Mom, where will I get my next school fees? Let them know God will provide. The next time you don't have food on the table and your children will question, Mom, when we, do we get to eat the next meal? Let them know God will provide. The next time they need new clothes, we are almost going to Christmas, and they are looking forward to having those clothes. Let them know God will provide. Because you want to build a culture in your family that understands the things we have, it's God who provides. And that's the only other way we can be able to take care of this and the next generation. We have a generation that believes in their own ability. They don't think that God can provide they believed in their own understanding. And that's why any parent today whose child does not qualify to go to the university becomes so depressed because this has become a standard measure, a standard unit for are you successful in life? Is your child smart enough? Because we have developed a culture that depends in our very own understanding. And in that sense, we have failed to testify about God. May God help us to learn to testify about the great things that he has done to us. Teach them his word. Testify about God. And lastly, train them to trust in God. Train them to trust in God. Again, I love stories. And uh, one of the stories currently in the media, Instagram, is a story by one Abel Mutua. And Abel Mutua told a story about this young man who had taken his wife to hospital because his wife was in labor and he didn't have money to bail his wife out of hospital. In fact, the wife had not even delivered, yet he was already stressed about it. And he called Abel Mutua and asked him, Boss, I, I think Nimefika Musho and I need uh, God to provide in whatever way. Otherwise, Binta Jinyonga. And Abel Mutua thought he was bluffing. Two days later, his body is found in Gong Forest. The guy took his life. And of all the reasons we can explain why this happened, I firmly believe that it is because this guy is a representative of this generation, of people who have learned to trust in their own abilities. People who have not been trained to trust in God. People who have not been trained to exercise faith in things that do not seem to be real. People who know what it means to depend on God even when things and times are tough. Remember the kind of families that we come from. How our parents always gave us the assurance when it was clear enough they have no way of providing. But yet they cultivated in our hearts that desire to trust in God. And I remember the many times we'd go to church and we would join them in praying for the same things because we knew 
It was never their doing. It was never our doing. It is God. It is God who provides. And that's what Asaph reminds them in verse 22. That he's want to, he challenges them and forces them to believe in God and to trust in his saving power. The generation that we have today is a generation that needs to be reminded to trust in God. The fact that we have trained our children to know that it is us who provide robs God of his glory and in return has exposed the generation to depression and mental health issues because they have learned to trust in their own abilities. And Proverbs 3 verse 5 and verse 6 is no longer part of their lifestyle. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your paths. This is a reality that is not in the lives of this generation. This generation has been trained that all you need to do is pray that your parents do well in life. Then they will pass on whatever they have made to you as inheritance. This is a generation that has only believed in the power of education and technology. And so they invest and pumped all their money in, in, in education and in technology because they firmly believe that all they need to do is trust in these systems. How many children today have become captives of gambling because they trust in these systems to generate wealth for them? How many people have lost huge amounts of money trying to pursue fast riches? This points to us the kind of generation that we have. And unless we are bothered about what is happening in our generation, then the next generation is doomed. And do you know which generation is that? It is the generation of your children. It is the generation of your grandchildren. If things are in such a mess today, imagine what will happen when my daughter Lisa is of age, she's 22 years old now, what will happen at that point? What will happen when a one-year-old today becomes a 30-year-old man in future? What kind of society are they likely to find? One of the th things that uh, Timothy Caberia mentioned to me last weekend was that when he assessed our congregation, he realized that our congregation, the age bracket for our congregation, would be on average between 25 and 40. That means, where are the young people? These young people that we are talking about are the people we call the next generation. Your children, your grandchildren. Are we bothered enough that these children and grandchildren do not understand the power of God? Do not understand the word of God? Do not understand the importance of putting their trust in God? And I want to believe that this is not a community problem. This is a personal problem problem that needs personal intervention. It is you who knows your family. It is you to ask yourself how and what can I do to make sure that the God that I know, the God who has saved me, the God who has preserved my salvation is also experienced down my generation. How do I make sure that my service to God on this pulpit is passed on to the next generation? Or will this be a sorry state of affair that I served God in my time and that was it? And the generation that comes after me is a generation that is sold out to ungodliness and immorality. Do you feel that you are challenged enough to consider your next generation, your generation and the next generation important to receive the power of God through his gospel? Brothers and sisters, it is time for us to stop faking it and face this reality that we have a lost generation. And if this is the kind of generation we have today, we can't imagine of how the next generation will look like. We can't imagine that 30 years from now, there could be a possibility that you'll go to a city to visit your child and they'll tell you, we don't go to church here. Church is for poor people because that's what is happening in Europe. Church is not important. Who is God? I'm educated. I have all the skills I need in life. 
Where was God when I was in school? Where was God when I was hurting? Where was God when things didn't happen the way I wanted them to happen? By my own strength, I fought through it. And you're telling me to go to church? To do what? That is a sad reality that awaits us 30 years from now. That is a sad reality that awaits all of us in the near future because of the generation that we have. Imagine this, that the generation today that already has problems is the generation that we trust to pass on the gospel to the next generation. Now ask yourself, if the current generation has not embraced the gospel, what are they passing to the next generation? And now revert back and realize this, that for this generation to have something to pass to the next generation, we have a duty to teach them the word of God, to testify about God, and to train them to trust God. And unless we do that, they will fail and we will be to blame. We will be to blame when they will realize that they put the, their trust on material things and when things didn't work out, their parents did not tell them that there were other superior powers beyond their abilities. And we'll be, stand, we'll be standing there guilty. We have a responsibility to teach the word of God. Because if we don't, how else will this generation that comes know God? We have a responsibility to testify about God. Because if we don't, how else will the next generation believe in God? We have a responsibility to challenge and train the next generation to trust in God. Because if we don't, how then will they have their hope in God? They will have a hopeless life unless their hope is in God. May the Lord remind us and equip us with the skills we need to teach this generation and the next the word of God. To testify about the great things that God has done in our lives and allow God to take credit for every good thing that has happened in our lives. And to train our brothers, our sisters, our children, our grandchildren on why it is urgent enough for them to trust in the Lord. Let's pray. We look at how our children have become so sold to sinfulness. We look at how immorality has become the order of the day. And Father, I want to come to your presence this day to thank you because you have allowed us this opportunity to think about this generation and how the next generation can be able to live for you. Our prayer, Lord, is that you're going to instruct our hearts and minds to desire to teach our children your word because this is the only means of them knowing who you are. We desire that, Lord, may you grant us many opportunities of our lives to testify about your goodness because this is the only opportunity that you have given us to make them believe that you exist, that you provide for your people. And Father, we desire that may you grant us the opportunity to train them to trust you because this is the only means of them having hope in you, a hope that is alive. And for moments when we have failed to do this, Father, we plead guilty and we ask of your forgiveness. And we pray that, Lord, may you burden our hearts with the desire to transform our families and the next generation for your glory. Be with us and bless us, O oh Lord. We pray that, Lord, you may be glorified in our lives. May you take all the glory because all this credit is accredited to you. For this is our prayer this morning in Christ, Lord, our Savior. Amen. Thank you so much.